I graduated from Texas A&M University with a degree in marketing and management a long time ago. Uh, I've lived in Austin for over 15 years. After graduation, my dream was to go live on the beach, have fun, and uh, enjoy life for a little bit. So I moved to California. I lived in Los Angeles for several years. Um, it's a great experience. Uh, traveled all around the country. Uh, from there, I had an opportunity to go work for a technology company in Portland, Oregon. So I lived in Portland, Oregon for four years. Decided it was time for me to come back home, and I've been in Austin ever since. Um, I, I've always been interested in business. Um, graduating from college, didn't know exactly what I want to do. Does anybody here know exactly what they want to do for the rest of their lives? I didn't think so. So that makes, yeah, if you can move up front, it'd be great. Just don't have to talk so loud. No worries. So are, are most of you sophomores, juniors, seniors? Seniors. 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 Okay. So graduate in either this semester or next semester or maybe in the summer. Uh, what are your plans? Uh, I want to open it up a little bit and kind of veer off my standard uh, presentation. Does anybody have any job opportunities already? You do? Uh, yeah. Oh, nice. So mostly retail. Does anybody want to do anything outside of retail? I want to do either marketing or advertisement. Okay, great. Uh, in, okay. Uh, interviewing with companies at this point? Yes. Okay. Does anybody want to have their own business? Maybe not right when they get out of college, but sometime in the future? I totally recommend it. After working for a company and working for someone else, you're going to realize that maybe your manager or your boss may not be the smartest person. Maybe you can do it better. <laughs> uh, maybe you decide you want to be the boss. And it's very rewarding, but it's also very hard. You have to work twice as hard. You're responsible for everything. And if you have employees, you're responsible for your employees. You gotta make sure they show up on time. You gotta motivate your employees. You have to uh, make sure that you have enough money in the bank to pay them. Uh, it's very challenging, but on the other hand, it's very rewarding. You get to make all the decisions. Uh, if you want to take, you know, a month off in the summer to go on vacation, you can do that. Um, it's, it's very rewarding. I totally recommend it. Uh, what I'm going to speak about today is um, investor presentations. At some point, you may decide you want to start your own business. And when you do that, you're gonna, the first thing you're going to ask yourself is, okay, number one, what kind of business do I want to start? And number two, uh, how am I going to make? How am I going to get the money to start the business? You may or may not have a rich uh, mother and father, or rich parents, or rich uncle that will give you the money to start. So you got to think of ways of how you're going to start the business. Uh, one of the things I do recommend at some point is if you decide to start a business, you also should consider buying a business. There's a lot of people that retire or they get tired of their business and they want to sell. If you buy a business, then you already have the phone ringing. You usually have customers. You already have cash flow. Um, so there's a, a lot of advantages to buying a business as well, too. So uh, let's uh, start here. The last nine years, I've been part of South by Southwest. Does anybody know what South by Southwest is? It's a big music, uh, film festival, and technology festival. Uh, I help out with the technology portion of the festival, and we put on an event called South by Southwest Accelerator Pitch Event. It's an event for startup companies. There's more than 500 companies that usually apply every year from around the world to come and present their idea or their company to investors and judges. As a result of presenting, a lot of them 
uh, get uh, millions and millions of dollars of investments into their uh, idea, whether it's an app, whether it's some kind of a social media platform, et cetera. But uh, it's really something that uh, is uh, very special and the fact that it's in Austin and all these people come from around the world just to present their idea, uh, it's really something to see. So if you guys ever get a chance, uh, I totally recommend it. So when presenting to investors, say you're gonna present to your mom and dad, say you're gonna present to someone you don't know, um, there's a template and people can vary from this template and it's not you know hard set in stone that you must follow this template but if you can do this people will listen to you and they'll listen to your idea and they may give you some money just to help start your business uh, i'm sure everybody's uh, been in classes or lectures where people go on and on and on and they put tons of information on the slide and you just glaze over and you're like, I'm ready for this to be done. I'm ready to fall asleep. So you wanna keep it short and simple. Uh, you can do it in a PowerPoint, you can do it in a PDF, but uh, the guidelines are to make it 10 pages long, no more, no less. Yeah, please move up front, please, if you don't mind. And do not make it longer than 20 minutes, because after 20 minutes, people get uh, a little bored. Uh, use large font, the minimum 30-point font, so you can read it on the screen. And uh, at the end of your presentation, be prepared to answer a lot of questions, because they're going to ask you everything about your business that you can think of. And so always be prepared. So the first uh, page or slide of your presentation, you want to put the title um, page with the name of your company and your contact information. Um, you talk a little bit about your business. What problem are you trying to solve? You know, students want uh, food delivery delivered. Um, maybe you have a food delivery idea, Grubhub, for example. There's, there's no such thing until Grubhub and all these other companies uh, came about, but at some point they had to start the company and grow the company, and they saw a problem that needed to be solved. Um, the third slide is your value proposition. What is your solution to the problem? Um, the fourth slide is your target market. Who is your customer? Who are you going to be selling to? And what size is that market? Is it a million dollar market or is it a billion dollar market? Does not, also, does not necessarily have to be big, but uh, the point is, is that it's got to be profitable. And then who are the competitors? Are there any competitors currently in the market that you're going to be competing against? And what's going to make you better than your competitors? Uh, the sixth slide is go to market. How are you going to launch your company and how are you going to reach your customers? What is your business plan? And then uh, on the seventh slide, you talk about your team. Is it just you? Is it you and a friend? Is it you and five employees? Are you going to be doing the sales? Who's going to be doing the order fulfillment? Who's going to be making the product? So you talk about your team and the background in each of those um, positions. And one thing we're going to be sp uh, focusing on today, which uh, Ms. Romo asked me to emphasize, is the financial projections and um, financial summary. What are sales? What are expenses? You know, what's the bottom line? How much money are you going to make? How are you going to pay back your investors, whether it's your mom and dad? the bank, everybody wants to know, how am I going to get my money back if I give you money? It's very important. Um, if you've already started the business, um, what type of traction do you have? Meaning, do you already have sales? Do you already have customers? Um, have you already built the product? Do you have a prototype? 
And then last but not, uh, not least is the executive summary. So you want a timeline of from when you launch your business to um, maybe projecting out one, two, three, four, five years um, on how you're going to scale the business, how you're going to grow it, how much uh, money are you looking for uh, for an investment, and how are you going to use the money to grow the business and start the business. As I said before, be ready to answer all types of questions, especially rate relating to financials. So you, uh, you're hearing me today, but I want uh, you to listen to someone closer to your age that has started a company, and we'll tell you a little bit about how he did it and putting together a presentation. on today are projections, finances, raising money, how do you start a business without any money, and i got a couple more great videos for you guys to uh, listen to. Um, there's a foundation called the Kaufman Foundation um, that invests a lot in education and entrepreneurship, so this is another great uh, website, another great organization where you can go to to learn about starting a company. engine of your business is your business model. In the business model, you develop your strategies and your tactics for making money as a business. Here now, what we're going to talk about is how to convert those strategies and tactics into financials. First, a quick review of your business model. At the core of your business model is your value proposition, right? Your value proposition is what benefit do you offer to your target customers? There should be an economic analysis that says that customers receive a certain quantifiable benefit from your value proposition. Anita Newton talks about your value proposition and your positioning statement in her wonderful series on entrepreneurial marketing. The key to the success of any business is to have a competitive advantage over all the other products out there. That enables you to convince your customers to buy your product instead of competitors' product. They might even be willing to pay more for your product. So understanding the economics of your competitive advantage is key to things like your pricing. The other thing you have to understand when you're thinking about your competitive advantage is, what are we going to have to spend? to keep that competitive advantage. We're gonna to have to keep investing in our product, in our technology, in our people, in order to sustain that competitive advantage. What's it cost for you to make the product, to service the product, then to sell the product and support the product? So the next obvious thing is your price. Your revenues are a function of your price times the number of units that you sell. Now, when you think about other elements of your business model, you think about things like your marketing strategy and your sales strategy. And we think of those as you know, strategies and tactics, but all of them have a financial impact. How much are you spending on marketing? What is the return on your marketing dollars spent? What are you spending on sales? How much does it cost to acquire a customer? So after you pull your business model together, you need to translate the elements of your business model into a business model formula. Your business model formula translates your business model into financials. So for example, we sell this product or service to these target customers. The reason our customers buy our product is this compelling benefit. We have an advantage over our competition because of this sustainable competitive advantage. We will become profitable in the nth quarter of 2000 and X by selling so many systems or licenses or units or subscriptions, whatever it is you're selling, to so many customers. We're gonna sell through these channels or partners or we're gonna sell directly at a price of X per system or license or customer or unit. 
with a cost of X dollars for each customer you acquire. At that point, our revenue run rate will be X million dollars on an annualized basis. Now we've been talking about your business model and your business model formula as if it's a fixed static thing, but it isn't. The reality is these things are changing all the time. So the trick is for you to get out there in the marketplace, quantify what's really going on, and bring it back and incorporate it into your business model formula. So you might think initially the cost of acquiring a customer should be this. You go out to the marketplace, it turns out it takes longer, it costs more. You've got to bring that back, build it into your business model. The point being, this is a constantly changing process. <clears throat> Investors want to know that you really understand more than just the strategies and tactics of your business model. They want to know that you understand how to translate those strategies into how you make money. They're going to want to know that you have a financial understanding of the implications of everything in your business model. So, for example, what is the sales cycle in your business? Are you going to be able to sell each customer in 45 days or 90 days or is it going to take a year? That has serious financial implication. Or, if you're in a consumer business, what's the conversion rate for consumers that come to your webpage? or for consumers that click on an offer. So you need to know these financial metrics. That's what I mean by translating your business model into a business model formula. Stop and uh, open the room up for questions. I know we cover, covered a lot of information in a short amount of time about getting prepared to launch a business or start a business and what all it entails. A lot of these um, guidelines are for tech companies primarily, but it, all, it also can work on just about any business that you uh, are thinking of. Does anybody have any questions at this time? Uh, anybody have any ideas that possibly down the road, uh, a business idea that they may want to start? I actually want to start like a after I've earned up money to start my own business, I want to start a coffee shop that is for, um, I'm originally from Dallas, so I want to start it by UTA, by um, the University of Texas at Arlington, because I know there's a lot of college students that would need to study there, and yeah, that's mainly the idea. And so, I'm sure you've uh, been to a lot of different coffee shops mm -hmm. at this point, and you're yeah. probably passionate about coffee. <laughs> um, a lot of people say follow your dreams, follow what you're passionate about, and you'll make money. I didn't believe that, but it's really true. Um, if you're doing something you believe in, that you feel passionate about, you're going to work harder as opposed to doing something that you really don't want to do just to make money. You're going to get burned out. And you're like, oh, this job sucks. You know? I want to open a coffee shop. That's what's going to make me happy. And if you do that, uh, eventually you'll realize that, hey, I'm happy. You know, there's this thing called work-life balance where you don't want to work 60, 80 hours a week just to make money because at the end of the day you're going to be stressed, you're not going to have fun, your life's going to be miserable. Uh, I totally believe that there's got to be a balance. And doing something that you're passionate about, uh, many times it won't feel like work. So let me tell you a story about myself and my wife. My wife's from Europe. We got married. She was already um, in the wedding business in Europe. She did um, decorations and flowers for wedding, and some wedding planning, and she did corporate events. She came to America, still learning English, um, worked for a couple of different uh, bridal salons in Austin. He said, you know, my dream is really to open a bridal salon. And even though I've been in the wedding business, I've always wanted to have a bridal salon and sell dresses. You know, I think that would be something that, you know, I could be happy doing every day. So she went, before starting the business or buying the business, which what we did, she went and worked at the competitors to see if she really liked the business. Because once you buy a business, you're making a, a pretty big commitment. You're 
I would say you're selling your soul, but that's your life, you know. When you work for a corporate uh, company, you go work from nine to five, and you go home, normally you forget about it. When you have a business, you're thinking about it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you, at, at the beginning, you're probably putting in 60, 80 hours a week just to get it going. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> So we bought a business. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and oh, thank you. And so we bought a business. Uh, we bought a bridal shop uh, in Austin. The business uh, was being run um, by someone that uh, was very young. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It was a mother and daughter. The mother bought the business, the mother had another business. They were working the business together. All of a sudden, they got in some conflict. The mother said, okay, I'm walking away from this business. Uh, she left it to her daughter, who just graduated from college. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but this business was overwhelming for one person. And unfortunately, the business suffered, and to the point to where if we didn't buy the business, it, they probably would have shut the doors down. That being said, we came in, we made some changes, uh, expanded, we moved to a new location. Uh, sales continue to increase every year. And um, it's, it's been a very rewarding business. Uh, we are helping uh, brides, or, you know, women, um, buy the most expensive garment of their lifetime. So they're putting a lot of trust in us and they're expecting us to be the experts. Some of our addresses, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000. So when somebody's spending that kind of money, they expect you to be the expert. They expect to get great customer service. Um, you know, they expect the dress to come in on time, and we also do alterations, and the alterations to be done on time, uh, so it's perfect for their wedding. Back to uh, finding a business that you're passionate about. Um, my wife is a late sleeper, and she goes to bed late. Every so often, she's up at the crack of dawn, or she's up before I am, and I get up pretty early. And either something's wrong, or she's worried about something. Every few months, she's up before I am. And the first thing I say is, what's wrong? You know, what are you worried about? You know, what's the problem? And many times she says, it's not a problem. I am so excited to go to work today, I couldn't sleep all night. So if you ever get to that point in your life, you're very lucky. And it's usually because you're doing something that you're very passionate about. Um, myself, I worked for several different companies before I started my own business. I didn't know what I wanted to do for the rest of my life out of college. I knew it was a business, it was marketing sales, which I did along the way. I worked for big companies, I worked for small companies. But everything you do is a learning process, and you'll learn more and more. And if you eventually want to start your company, your own company, you'll have the skills um, necessary to do it, because you'll have experience. So here's uh, another person that started his own company, and I really like what he has to say. And it can apply to many different companies or businesses. But uh, if you listen to him, and he's, he's done very well, he's been very successful, uh, take some notes and um, they will apply and you'll... Like it, it's fascinating to me that all the successful entrepreneurs I know, they look at being resourceful, they don't look at somebody else needs to pay for this thing. <laughs> to fund your startup. In this video, I'm going to help you overcome the challenges. Maybe you have an idea and you're wondering like, where does the money come to get this thing started? Or you don't feel like you know the right people in your life to actually help support you, maybe lend you some money to build the first prototype. Those are real challenges, but here's what I know, is I know that some of the best entrepreneurs that I've ever met never looked at um, capital as the primary challenge. They always looked at being resourceful. And I wanna, I wanna unlock that and show you literally eight different ways to fund your startup.
Okay, it's super powerful. Now, I've been fortunate enough that, you know, I've done pretty much every one of these, I've gone through some incarnation. I started building companies when I was 17, uh, failed, did it again when I was 19, failed, tried again finally after like consulting and, and licking my wounds and building my confidence back up. And at 24, I started a company called Spirit Technologies with the money I saved. But then I've also gone in and invested in a ton of other companies with my own money. Companies like Intercom that's gone on to raise you know, tens of millions of dollars in funding. Udemy, um, supporting my brother and his company, supporting my friends locally. Like, I, What I've learned is there are different ways to get your dreams, your product, your software funded, and that's what I wanna share with you guys today. The first one for me is bank or credit cards. I think that Many people start off and they think, well, I need to get an investor to get involved in my business to start, and that couldn't be further from the truth. At the end of the day, if you are a credible person and you haven't made horrible life decisions that have just like cratered your credit score or relationship with your banker, then you should be able to go to the bank and borrow some money. I mean, ideally, you'd have a credit card. I mean, some of the best companies, Airbnb, Joe and Brian talked about it. We like apply for all these different credit cards at the exact same time and use that funding to start Airbnb. I started pretty much with my credit card because I, I mean, if any expenses like servers or whatever, that was the way I started. When I started NB Host, we needed to buy software and infrastructure and uh, we had lines of credit. And I mean, that was, you know, personal lines of credit, loan to the business, bought all the infrastructure. So I just think business banking, bank loans and credit cards do have this place, especially credit cards. I just. I love meeting founders that hustled so hard to just make it work. The second thing is um, to trade equity, and that's both uh, equity in the business, so the value of the business or a piece of the business, and uh, sweat equity, your time. So this is nights and weekends and just making it work. I mean, a lot of you guys have jobs, and I think people think they need to quit their job to start the business, and that's just not the case. What I always say is try to get this new business to at least you know 60 to 70% of your current income and then make the swap. I mean, my favorite story to share is Plenty of Fish. The guy, you know, plentyoffish.com got bought for 550 million uh, within I think a nine to 10 year period and he started off by running home every day at 4 p.m. and coding till 11 p.m. and getting up early at you know 5 a.m. and coding before he went to work at nine and going to work and, and working over lunch. And that to me is a beautiful thing. So trade equity, either hire services or professionals to get equity. Um, to get them involved in your business to help fund things. The third one is startup accelerators. In most cities in North America, whatever part of the world you're watching this video at, you probably have a startup accelerator that's willing to give you 25, 50K, some give 250K, um, to seed and incubate your idea. And you just need to go through the application process. And it's crazy, like why Commodore and Techstars is harder to get into than Harvard, but um, those are legit options for the local accelerators. Many of them have a lack of entrepreneurs coming to them with viable ideas. Like they don't have enough applicants that are serious and motivated and have something worth building. So your idea presented in a super compelling way and with a lot of passion and commitment is probably gonna get you in there and get some of that funding. The fourth area is VCs and professional investors. So VC stands for venture capitalists. These are people that manage funds, so they, they actually go up and raise their own money, which is kind of neat when you understand that. So you're raising money from them. They actually have to do the exact same exercise and raise from what's called limited partners. And now the VCs have to make decisions on who they give money to because they need to generate a return over a 10 year period. I say that is because there are thousands of venture capitalists in the world and they're looking for the entrepreneurs. And just so you know, they don't have a job unless people like you go out there and create the future. And I think that's an exciting place to come from and a, and a kind of a reframe from what many entrepreneurs starting off get into, which is I need their money to be successful. At the end of the day, they need you to actually be successful in their fund. So VC is a great source. Uh, another one would be local angels and kind of high net worth people. So in your community, you have angel groups. These are people that uh, own real estate, they own the car dealerships, they may own um, really profitable, um, high revenue businesses, and they want to diversify. They can get involved with like young and eager and fun companies. So they're part of these angel groups and you can actually 
Uh, maybe on a quarterly basis they have a meeting where you can come in and pitch and raise money that way. So that is a super uh, valuable and typically open up to everybody, you know, even in towns of 100,000 people, they have an angel group in your state or province. Six would be uh, crowdfunding. You know, uh, one of my buddies, Clay Hebert, one of the foremost top experts on crowdfunding, he said it best, is he said that the cost of failure is gonna go to zero because crowdfunding has leveled the playing field for market validation before you build anything. So not only is crowdfunding an incredible source of capital to, or, or money to start the company, it's also a beautiful way of testing if there's a need, if there's people out there that actually wanna buy what you're gonna build or sell. And um, you can do that on Indiegogo or you know, Kickstarter really doesn't like software projects. Uh, GoFundMe, there's a ton of different crowdfunding platforms, but at the end of the day, just so you know, it's 20% video and the page itself and the story you write about your project, your software project, and really 80% about marketing and distribution. They're not gonna get you the project funded. You're gonna have to do some work, email some bloggers, email the press, really drum up a lot of interest in that crowdfunding campaign. So super powerful, but there's work involved, so don't you know, this, be misled and think this is gonna be easy peasy, because it's not. The uh, seventh is friends and family. Sometimes they call it fools, and I just find that super insulting. So friends and family. These are people that know you best, that believe in your vision, and are willing to back you. I remember when I started my company, Flowtown, with my co-founder, Ethan, it was early days, and I had sold my previous company, Spheric, so financially I was in a good spot, and I could have funded the whole company, but one thing that I felt, um, and really this was just as a way for us to set the foundation as strong as possible, uh, I said to him, look, I'll fund you know, 70% of this, but I need you to go and raise the balance, 30%, from your friends and your family members, and whoever, literally just like go find somebody that's gonna lend you the money and meet me halfway. And this was a huge reason. This, and like, I always knew Ethan was incredible, but I remember this was like a conversation on a Friday, and on Monday he called me and he says, I got the money. And I was like, all right, dude, did you do anything illegal? And he's like, no. I'm like, where did you find that money? We're talking tens of thousands of dollars. And he said, my mom gave me some money, my dad gave me some money, and a couple of best friends from college gave me some money. And for me, as a partner, that just said so much about Ethan. Even though we had just kind of got to know each other over the previous year, here are people that have known him his whole life and were willing to part way with arguably one of the most you know, valuable assets in somebody's life. They were, they were willing to invest in him. And really before there was any product or proof that this was gonna work. And I just thought that said so much. So friends and family I think is an incredible um, just be honest with them. Just tell them, it's high risk, and I'm gonna make the best decision I can with the information I have, but don't give me money you wouldn't be comfortable losing 100%. I just think that that's where things get a little dicey when people misalign expectations. And number eight, the most important, uh, and I'm gonna share a really quick tip for you right after this, eight is to fund yourself. I think so many uh, people have jobs and they go, well, I'm gonna quit my job and pursue this idea uh, once I raise money. And when I hear that, just so you know, what I'm thinking is you don't even trust yourself or willing to bet on yourself and you expect me to fund that risk. And that to me is just crazy. If you're not willing to put all in, you know, slide all the chips, that's what this, what this motion is, uh, go all in on your idea, but yet you expect everybody else to, I think that's just a negative signal and just a really weird place to start a relationship with investors. So funding yourself digging into your own savings. I mean, maritime vacation was friends and family. I, my dad essentially helped fund that business and I, to this day, continue to tell that story because it was super incredible for him to believe in me at 17 years old. Envy Host was my line of credit with my brother and his line of credit to fund all the servers. Um, Sphere Technologies was working and funding in myself and saving up $70,000 to eventually start that company. Flowtown was, again, me putting my own money in, Ethan putting some of his in, and eventually we raised venture capital for professional investors, you know, guys like, you know, Steve Anderson from Baseline Ventures, uh, first investors in Instagram and Twitter, and just like, uh, and then Clarity again, Mark Cuban invested in that, but I put in, you know, almost half a million dollars of my own money to get that company started, and then we eventually raised 1.6 million, but it's, it's kind of like all eight of these put together. Now, I never did an accelerator. I have a great video on how to start your own accelerator if you wanna search that out. I think it's, it's a great way if you don't get in, it doesn't mean you should stop doing the things you would've got as value from those accelerators. 
But those eight tips, right? You know, the going to the bank, using lines of credit, you know, trading equity to help bring in resources and or sweat equity to build the business, to use startup accelerators as a way to fund, validate, and help you grow the business, to reach out to VCs and professional investors is, is you know, super smart. Going to the local angel groups or finding those high net worth individuals, they're there, they're in your city, they've got millions of dollars, hundreds of millions in some cases, and to throw a check your way for 50K is not crazy. Crowdfunding, cost of zero, cost of failure goes to zero. Friends and family is a beautiful thing because it says so much about trust. And then finally, invest in yourself. That is my mission. Now the tip is, is the mindset. Here's the way I think about it. Don't raise more money than you're willing to lose, and if you lose it, you chalk it up as learning, okay? So that's the way I think about it, is you're investing in yourself, in your business, not so much for the financial outcome, but your opportunity to learn. So in some ways, it becomes uh, education. And that's the way I think about it, so I don't get too hard on myself if like, I put 20K into a small little project and it fails, I just chalk it up as learning. Now, the best ultimate financing ever, the world's best, I like crowdfunding, I just call it customer financing. Finding customers to pre-buy the product that you want to build as an early adopter, it's a whole framework I've created um, called the customer creation model, but it is the best form of financing. As per usual, I hope this video finds you incredibly well. I want to challenge you to live a bigger life and a bigger business, and I'll see you next Monday. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to my channel for other videos on how to start and grow your startup. I'd also encourage you to join my newsletter for invites to private events, exclusive contests, and other free training materials. If you're ready to get going, I got two other videos queued up for you right now. I'll see you next Monday. So I really like Dan's uh, video. He gives a lot of really good uh, tips and content. Um, gives you really a lot of good information. So, one of the themes is self-funding. If you wanted to start your business, say you got a job, say you start saving money, uh, say you have a credit card, which a lot of these companies do start on credit cards. But one of the other things that uh, he mentions, you know, maybe starting small. Does, it, does, there, does everybody, Everybody know of Tor Torchy's Tacos? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I remember when he was he started his business in a little trailer off of uh, South First Street downtown. From that trailer, he you know proved this concept, and then he started his first brick and mortar uh, restaurant, and then from there he just continued to grow. But he started small. He proved his concept. So uh, you know when Dan was talking about you know. Let's go out and see if we can get some customers. Um, say you want to start a coffee shop. Maybe you start in a little trailer. Maybe you start a little kiosk. And then if that's successful, then you could grow to maybe a retail 2,000 square feet coffee shop or something that can compete with uh, Starbucks. But there's so many different ways uh, that you can start a business. And unless, you know, all of you guys got rich parents or come from a really wealthy family, it can be very hard. And uh, you know, don't invest all the money that you're not willing to lose because uh, one thing that a lot of startups, especially these days, um, they may have one idea that they come up with that they think is going to make them money and then they find something and do something completely different. So it's a learning process, and everything that you do is going to be learning and experience. So you know, uh, within the first five years, 50% of all companies fail. So you want to think things out before you arbitrarily just go out there and say, I want to start a business and have no clue. So if you can go out and prove your concept, either sell fund or talk to people that maybe are in the business that uh, can help uh, fund you. As you mentioned, you know, family, friends, friends of friends, whoever you can convince. Because at the end of the day, whoever's going to give you money believes in you. Uh, you may have the greatest concept, but it's all about you. 
they're expecting you to execute on whatever business plan that you have. Um, so, one day maybe you guys, I don't know if anybody's been in the horse races, but the people that do very well from betting on horses bet on the jockey, not the horse. And the same goes with the company. They're betting on the people that are running that company and they're betting on you. So you gotta convince them that your idea is gonna be successful and that you're gonna be able to execute. So when you're talking to people to raise money or somebody invests, whether it's your family, whether it's uh, a bank, you know, they're gonna first wanna know how much money do you need? And how, um, and how and when will they get their money back? That's most important. Uh, nobody wants to invest in something that they know is going to be a failure because they're probably not going to do it. So when you're talking to investors, uh, also kind of want to make a side note when you're going on interviews as well to always show up early and always follow up. I can't tell you how many times I probably interviewed in the last 10 years probably three or four hundred candidates, and so many more I just weed out that apply for one of my companies. Um, they'll show up late, they'll show up without their resume, and they never follow up and say, thank you for your time. Those little things will set you apart above everybody else. And if you haven't done it yet, one of the things I do recommend is starting a portfolio. Whether it's a letter that you receive from one of your teachers, uh, maybe it's an award you received, maybe it's a project you worked on, but start building a portfolio because when you're out interviewing, and is everybody interviewing right now? What are you, you gotta think about it this way, what are you doing to set yourself apart from everybody else? It doesn't matter if you have the best grades, you know, if you're not able to present yourself and speak about yourself, and convince somebody that I am better than anybody else, you're probably not gonna be successful and you're wasting your time. So please think about those things, especially before you go to an interview. You know, is there something that I can do differently? I'm gonna share a little uh, experience that I had, how I landed my first job. So I was working at a, at, at a restaurant during college. Someone came in, these guys in suits, sit at a table, I start chatting them up, and you know, I was their waiter. I said, well, what do you guys wear? Oh, we work at this big, um, I'm from Houston, big uh, chemical company, and we're here for lunch. We have a big manufacturing plant right down the road. So really, I said, I'm just uh, graduated from college, or I'm about to graduate from college, and I'm looking for a job. The guy said, oh really? He goes, well actually, we're actually looking to hire a marketing representative, someone right out of college. Can you send me your resume? Sent him my resume. He called me back the next day and said, can you be here tomorrow? So I had a short amount of time. I had no idea exactly what they did and anything about their business. So I went online and found as much information as I could. I did an analysis on their competitors. I put together just a simple two-page report. When I got there, I presented it to them. No one else has done this. You show me that you put in the effort, and even though you don't know anything about the business, you are willing to go above and beyond, and those are the type of people we're looking for. You're putting in the effort, the initiative. I interviewed, that was the longest interview I ever had in my life, from nine in the morning to four in the afternoon. And I interviewed with, I think it was five different people. Uh, they did take me to lunch. Um, but by the end of the day, I got the offer and they said, can you start tomorrow? So those are things you really need to think about. And you know, these days, life in general is competitive. So uh, think about those things um, when you're interviewing or talking to someone about a job. Uh, networking, if you guys are part of any associations, you know, any 
type of groups that uh, may be business related or in an industry that you're looking to get into. Those are very powerful uh, because you never know, just like I landed my first job, who you're going to meet that could, you know, introduce you to somebody that uh, is looking uh, for someone just like you. And, uh, you know, when it comes time to starting a business, as I said before, consider buying an existing business because the phone is already ringing. Perfect example, you said you wanted to interested in a coffee shop, I had a friend that bought a coffee shop in Austin, and she's made some changes and grew it, but the coffee shop she bought already had customers coming in the door from the day one. She didn't have to go and create everything, spend a lot of money on marketing. She did change some things, she did increase the marketing, but day one she had money coming in the door. So it's something to think about. I have a question. So how would you find those businesses that are willing to sell? Okay. So, for example, the, the business um, that we purchased from our wife, the bridal mm -hmm. salon, back to being aggressive. Um, but you're right. How do you find those? What I did, I picked up the phone and started calling every single bridal retail shop in Austin until I found someone that says, guess what? As a matter of fact, we are thinking about selling. Can I meet with you? Went in there, met with them. Um, this is one thing that you gotta be weary of. Most businesses that are looking to sell or someone's looking to retire, they always think their business is worth 10 times, maybe even more than it really is. Um, so we made an offer on the business and said, this is what we, we did the evaluation, this is what we think the business is worth. And of course, she wanted five times more than what our offer was. We saw that the business was in trouble. Nine months later, she came back and says, we need to sell immediately. They owed a lot of money to a lot of their uh, vendors. And said, if you are still willing um, to pay what your offer was at, when you, you know, first looked at the company, we're willing to sell it to you. The other thing too is people, maybe this, you know, they've had the business for a while, but maybe somebody had the business all their life. A lot of times what happens, their children don't want to be in the business, they're looking to retire, so they wind up selling. But they want to sell it to someone that they really can connect with, that they know that if they pass it on to, they're going to continue to run the business and grow the business, because they put so much of their life in the business. So meeting with people, connecting with them, um, that's that's important too, but there's several sites, uh, especially now with the internet. Biz buy sell. If you go to that site, there's tons of coffee shops, <laughs> um, and people either hire a business broker or they try to sell the business themselves, and they'll advertise it on there, and then you just respond and say, I'm very interested. You know, one of the things, can you show me your financials? You know, how much money did you? How much money, um, how much sales are you doing every year? What are your expenses? And that's key, and that's what they talked about. You know? Basically, sales minus expenses equals income, profit. And that's what you can pay home business in your market. So, um, yeah, and, and another thing too, I mean, you can, there are so many low cost, you know, startup companies that you can do. Uh, service or a consulting company that don't cost anything you know if you're a tutor you know you guys may have uh, more experience than a lot of the freshmen that may are struggling with certain classes it doesn't cost you anything except your time right i'll charge you 25 dollars an hour to work with you and that's an easy start dog walker you know basically it's nothing you're spending your time, but you're getting money coming in. Uh, and I'll put some other examples, graphic, interior designer, event planner, real estate agent. All those are very low cost uh, startup companies that you can do pretty much on the street. And I just put up a list of references here if you guys ever wanna 
look at more places to find information about starting a company, funding a company. Um, as Dan mentioned, there's a lot of incubators or accelerators, which basically are places where you can go get all the information, get help, get mentors that will help you start a company. Um, there's one called the Capital Factory in Austin. Uh, there's one called Geekdom in San Antonio and the Houston Technology Center in Houston. There's an angel investor network specifically working with startup companies that are looking to invest in startup companies. There's a bunch of different conferences you can go to and books that you can read as well. Um, I want to give you my contact information. So we've been part of uh, Texas State uh, internship program for the fashion merchandising um, department. And every year we hire interns try to teach them about a small business and the bridal industry. So if anyone is interested, please send me your resume. Um, we are located in Austin, um, but we get a student every semester to come out and intern. This time I'd like to open up, we only got a few minutes left, open up the room to any questions. Hopefully you guys learned something about starting a business. <coughs> Hopefully one day you get one day you guys will have your own business. Any questions? Sure. Uh, what's the bridal shop called? Melange Bridal. I live in Austin. Awesome. That's my. Oh, okay. Great. Um, any other questions? Oh, I, I have a question. Um, for the ten slides, what was number four and five? Because I didn't get to it right then. Uh, I think we're gonna send this to. Oh, yeah, students, I'll right? send you all the video. Okay. And don't hesitate to go back because there's, you can go online and put up uh, present investor, or search investor presentations. Mm -hmm. There's tons of videos, there's tons of websites that will tell you. And those are just the basic guidelines. You can vary a little bit um, for, what, for whatever you're looking to do. Thank you. Well, I hope uh, you guys learned something. I wish you the best for your final year in college. And if you guys are ever in Austin, Looking to get married. Come by and see us. <laughs>